Hey guys and welcome to A-Level Chemistry and Physics. Today we will be covering Kirchhoff's Laws which is a continuation of our electricity playlist for the AS level syllabus. Um, this, is a, this will be a rather short video because there is not much content in this chapter but rather just practice. Okay, so yeah, we'll get down to it. So Kirchhoff's basically has two laws. Kirchhoff's first law is essentially about current. Okay, so you should be familiar with the idea that if there is a string of wire that is conducting 5 amps of current for example and then it splits into two different wires or two different junctions of 2 amps and 3 amps in a parallel circuit for example. The total amount of current before and after the split still remains the same. Right? There is 5 amps before the split and 2 plus 3 5 amps after the split. There is no excess current that is randomly appearing out of nowhere, nor, nor is any of it disappearing. So this is the basis of Kirchhoff's first law. Okay, it states that the sum of the currents entering a point in a circuit is equal to the sum of the currents leaving the same point. Right, this is rather intuitive, but and Kirchhoff's first law is actually much easier to apply than the second one, but it is still very important that you ensure that you form the equations correctly as we'll, we'll come to it. So this is the example, right? So this is a series circuit where there is just a point P marked, right? And there is I1 and there is I2, but there is no splitting at point P happening. In this example, however, there is a point Q where this wire distributes into two parts, right? So we know here I1 is equal to I2 as we can, as is written over here, right? Because obviously they are equal on the left and the right. But here I1 is equal to I2 plus i3 because again the total current leaving uh, entering a point which is point q is equal to the total current leaving a point which is equal to i2 i2 plus i3 right and what Kirchhoff's law Kirchhoff's first law is essentially an expression of the conservation of charge right we know that current is essentially the rate of flow of charge right we did, did, did in our previous video about electricity and current so if the rate of flow of charge is, if there is a current through point P and point Q, charge neither appears nor disappears from anywhere. It is always conserved both on the left and the right. So if there are 1 billion electrons entering a point, there should also be 1 billion electrons exiting the point in the same interval of time, right? Because that is current. So yeah, that's the first law, very straightforward and easy. So Kirchhoff's second law. The second law states that the sum of the EMFs around the loop or the electromotive force around the loop is the circuit is equal to the sum of the potential differences around the same loop, right? This, this is rather different. It sounds a little new, but you are already roughly aware of this law when you apply the rule that all voltages of components in a series circuit add up to the voltage across the power source, right? So I'll show you a diagram here. So this is a typical series circuit over here, right? You have uh, a power source with voltage E, there is current I flowing through the circuit, there is R1, a component with resistance R1, a component with resistance R2. So since it is a series circuit, the current is always constant, right? Current does not change, that is I over here and I over here. And therefore we don't, there is no second, first law interference in this, right? We can just concentrate on the second law because there is no distribution of current. Now. You see expression over here, E is equal to IR1 plus IR2. If you remember the Ohm's law equation, it states V is equal to IR, right? So if you put a voltmeter across this R1, the voltage across this will be I, which is constant for the whole circuit, into R1. Same for the second component, I into R2. So E or the electromotive force provided by the battery is equal to the sum of the potential differences between these two components. For R1 it is IR1, for R2 it's IR2. Therefore E is equal to IR1 plus IR2. And this again is EMF of battery is equal to sum of PDs across the resistors. So, right, so this is what is the basis of the second law and this is how it is applied. So now we have a more complicated example, okay, you have see this circuit over here. Now one thing before we start getting into the pointers is we have to talk about our references, 
or reference points. So here, what the reference point is that the anti-clockwise is positive. Now, what do I mean by that? Right. So you see a current here I1 and current here I2. Right. They are moving in opposite directions. So one will cancel the other out. So we have to make sure, but we don't know which one is greater, right? We don't know if I1 is greater than I2 or I2 is greater than I1. So what we do is we just take a reference point that I1 is positive and I2 is negative. Therefore, the net current flowing through this would be I1 minus I2. If the net comes out to be negative, that means let's say we took a reference point, but the, uh, the current is coming to be minus 2. If it is minus 2 downwards, it will just be 2 amps upwards. So our reference point here, as you can see here and here, that anti-clockwise is positive. Okay, this has to be very clear. So now we're coming to the EMFs, right? There are only three power sources in the current, in the circuit, E1, E2, E3. It's anti-clockwise is positive. That means current is going out from E1 over here, right? We talk about conventional current, which always originates from the positive plate. So the current originating from E1 is positive. Same for E2, the current originating from E2 is positive. But E3, the current originating from E3 opposes the current produced from E2 and E1. Therefore, E3 will be negative. So sum of EMFs is E1 positive, E2 again positive, but E3 because it's opposing the direction is negative. Right? So E1 plus E2 minus E3. This is one equation, right? Now we come to potential differences. This is a little more complicated because it has more variables, but otherwise if you follow well, it is um, straightforward. So we have I1 over here again, going clockwise, uh, anti-clockwise. I1 is positive. So it will be the voltage across R1 is I1 R1, right? So again, we have that over here as positive. Then you see I2 is flowing in the opposite direction or clockwise. So therefore the current I2 is negative. So the voltage across R2 is minus I2 R2, which you can see over here. Again, going anti-clockwise, you can see the I2 is also, I2 is over here as well. So again, it will oppose the direction of the current. Therefore it is minus I2 R3 because we're talking about this component. And then we go back to I1. I1 is positive because it is along the anti-clockwise reference point we are using. So again, it will be plus I1 R4, right? That's, so again, it's noted over here also that I2 is clockwise. Therefore, therefore all components which, uh, which use I2 to define their voltage will have a negative sign behind them. In the end, what we do is we basically equate these two equations because as we had defined before, the sum of EMX is always equal to sum of potential differences. So E1 plus E2 minus E3 will be equal to I1 R1 minus I2 R2 minus I2 R3 plus I1 R4, right? This is how you essentially form equations when there are opposing currents, different power sources and so on. So we talked about how the first law originates on the principle of conservation of charge. Right, because the number of charges entering a point is equal to number of charges exiting a point in the same interval of time. The second law originates from the conservation of charge. Right, so we know that through a circuit, the electrons are the charge carriers. They flow through the entire circuit. Um, when the electrons pass through the power source, which is generating the electromotive force or the like cells and batteries, it gains energy. Okay it gains energy so that it can travel through the whole circuit. When it is passing through the other components like bulbs, buzzers, etc., the energy of the electron is used up so that the component can work. So some energy of the electron is used up when it passes through a bulb, for example, and it's converted to light and heat, right, and so on. So once the electron completes its round and comes back to the exact same position as its starting point, it would have the exact same energy as when it started, right? This is a rule of thumb. This is because if the energy is different, right? If it is more than before, then we're essentially generating energy out of nowhere because 
an electron traveling the same distance and coming back to the same point has greater energy, which is not possible. Without any external influence, it cannot have greater energy than its origin. So at the coming back to the same point, the net change in energy of the electron is zero. That means the energy gained by the electron from the power sources is equal to the energy lost by the electron by the other components. Right? This is crucial to the origin of the second law. Right? So, but then we come down to the definition of electromotive force. Right? What is electromotive force? It is simply the energy gain per coulomb of charge as it passes through a force. Right? That is the definition of electromotive force. The amount of energy it gains when passing through a source. Simply, a potential difference is the energy lost per unit coulomb as it passes through a component. From this equation, we put in EMF, which is equal to this, or the left-hand side of the equation, and we put in potential differences, that is the right side of the equation. That is how we come to the conclusion that electromotive force is equal to potential difference. And then if we use the units, one volt, which is the unit for electromotive force, is equal to one joule per coulomb because that is how we're defining voltage and charge, right? Because when once we define current, once we define voltage, we say that one volt is essentially energy gained per coulomb or energy lost per coulomb. So this is the equation. Now we come to another sub section of the chapter, which is talking about a derivation of formula for resistance. So we have done traditional formula that if in the series circuit, we just add all the resistances of the components together to get the total resistance of the circuit. In a parallel circuit, we add the inverses of all the components and then we inverse the sum again. That is how uh, the total resistance of a parallel circuit is calculated. Now we come to how, what is the origin and derivation of these formulae. Okay, so the origin is essentially from Kirchhoff's law, right? So take two resistors of resistance R1 and R2, right? This is the circuit. So according to the Kirchhoff's law, we know that in a series circuit, the current holds constant, right? So the current is constant throughout both and the total voltage across the whole circuit is equal to the sum of the voltages across these two components, right? V is equal to V1 which is the voltage across R1 plus V2, or the voltage across R2. Again, from Ohm's law, we know that V is equal to IR, right? So IR, which is the total voltage across the circuit, is equal to IR1, the voltage across R1, plus IR2, the voltage across the R2, right? Again, this is Kirchhoff's law, that the voltages add up, to the potential differences add up to the EMF of the uh, the battery or the power source. But we know that I is constant throughout the whole circuit. So we take I common from this side and cancel it out. Right? Because I is present on both sides. So canceling the common factor I gives R is equal to R1 plus R2. You can just repeat this calculation for any more resistances that you add. R2, R3, R4, R5 and so on. But this is what the derivation is. And oftentimes you get this derivation in the AS level paper. So please practice it, note it down because it, you, uh, it is very important and it will also help you clear out concepts on the application of Kirchhoff's law. Now this is the second um, circuit. Okay, now we're talking about the total resistance in a parallel circuit, right? So again, we have resistance R1, R2. There is a now the situation is that there is a current in I which gets divided into I1 passing through R1 and I2 passing through R2, right? But now we use Kirchhoff's first law which says that a total charge entering a point is equal to total charge exiting a point, right? So at this junction, I, which is entering a point is equal to I1 plus I2, which are exiting the point. So we... So this is this equation we get from the first law, right? Now we come to Kirchhoff's second law. Second law states that I1 R1 minus I2 R2 is equal to zero, right? But the question is, how do we come to this? Because the second law states that the total voltage across these two 
should be equal to the voltage across the power source. However, there is no power source in this equation, right? There is no power source. You cannot see any EMF. E. So I1 R1 minus I2 R2 because this is in the opposite direction. If you take the same reference point is equal minus I2 R2 is equal to zero, right? So this is equal to zero, which means that the potential and so once we take I2 R2 to that side, I1 R1 is equal to I2 R2, right? Because there is no power source. If you just take this to the other side, because the right hand side is zero, I1 R1 will equal to I2 R2. That means the voltage across both of these components is equal, right? Then again, we come down to Ohm's law. V is equal to IR, I is equal to V over R, I1 is equal to V over R1, I2 is equal to V over R2. Okay. Then we just substitute these equations. So I is equal to I1 plus I2, we determined that before. Then V over R is equal to V over R1 plus V over R2. Right? Because we're just substituting them. And because the voltage is same across both components, the voltage cancels out. And we get 1 over R is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Right again, you can keep doing this for more uh, resistances and you'll get the answer. I know this is a little lengthy and tedious. If you want, you should you can rewatch the this part of the video to understand it again. Because the catch here just is that there is no power source. So voltages across both of them are equal. That's it. So that's all for this video, guys. Thank you for watching. Um, this is a chapter that requires much more practice than understanding. There is, you won't get much out of just watching this video or reading the book. There is, because of the calculations and complexity involved, the more practice you do, the more the better. And I'll leave my email ID again in the description. Shoot me your doubts if you want to. Leave any comments in the description. Uh, leave any comments if you want to, such as the quality of the video, any feedback, any topics you want me to cover, so on and so forth. And hit the subscribe button because we need to get this to as many people as possible. Right? Thank you so much for watching. Uh, see you in the next video. Bye-bye.